Um, I want to talk a little bit, though, about some other projects that I've been working on that are predicated on some of um, what I see as being the missed opportunities with embodied interaction in ILIs. Um, so, you know, if you, if you cut into this embodied cognition theory, you know, we have all of this meaning imbued in our limbs, and every time we use them, it activates, you know, these cognitive um, predispositions that we're not even aware of. But these exhibits aren't really taking advantage of that, right? This is a very literal use of embodied interaction. It's just showing you how to move your body. And this one is, is there's no real um, meaning behind the gesture this person is using to control this. They you know, may as well be using a mouse. It, it doesn't really, I mean, they could be using this sort of swipe gesture. They could be snapping for all, you know, for all the exhibit cares. I mean, it, it doesn't rely on the nature of that gesture, that physicality. So the kind of questions that I'm interested in with some of my other projects are, you know, how can we really take deeper advantage of this embodied interaction uh, and ex exploit the embodied cognition? Um, so one of these projects, um, this is in partnership with the Brookfield Zoo. Um, we were, um, we actually didn't start doing this as an embodied interaction exhibit at all. Uh, we were uh, brought together on a climate change education grant, and we were faced with this challenge that you know visitors, by and large, and, and the general populace at large, just don't understand climate change. They don't understand the quantitative aspects of climate change. They have particular trouble with two things. They have trouble with the magnitude of climate change impact, and they have trouble with the variability within the climate change data. So um, when I mean magnitude, I mean we're talking about an exponential change, uh, both in the temperature and its impact on, on various animals and ecosystems. And ex exponents, people have a hard time with exponents. They understand more, but they don't understand a heck of a lot more, and it keeps getting more. <laughs> you know, it's, it's just a hard concept. We're not wired that way. Um, and then the variability. This one is, is really tricky because a lot of people will look at data like this, and you know, here's the trend line for climate change, but then these are all the individual data points. And I say, well, gosh, that's not the data. You know, this line you're showing me, that's not really what's happening. Um, they tend to associate variability within the individual data points with um, I, inaccuracy, with lying, with, I mean, there are all sorts of negative associations. They, they feel like that they're, they're being lied to. They don't understand that variation is a normal part of um, any sort of data that one collects. Mm -hmm. And so we thought, well, this would be an interesting application of embodied interaction. Is there something we can do? Because um, we know that showing people graphs and telling people about it not only doesn't work, it actually tends to decrease the number of people that subscribe to climate change over time. I don't know if you guys have paid attention to these studies, but as you know, public education efforts have ramped up, the number of people that are concerned or even believe in climate change has gone down. So that's not working. So we thought, okay, what about a different modality? What if we try a physical modality to convey these kinds of things? What if we let them feel the magnitude of the impact of climate change? And what if we let them experience variability by letting them be a data point within a larger data collection trend. And so um, we wanted to structure an experience that um, would let them experience what a polar bear experiences as climate change impacts them. Um, we happen to know, thanks to some very brave scientists who go out into the Arctic, dart these polar bears and put them on, I, I kid you not, put them on treadmills or in water tanks with uh, oxygen sensors on their snoots and they can calculate, this is work that has been done. We use this in our research. Uh, they can calculate how many calories they burn, whether they're walking or swimming. And it turns out that ratio is 1 to 2.6. Do they and pay these polar bears? What's up? Do they pay them? <laughs> I don't think they get a consent form either. I, I mean, the IRB would, yeah. I mean, I, I guess if the polar bear really doesn't consent, he could make that known, I, I guess. I don't know. But um, yeah, I, I've seen some of the greatest diagrams ever in these papers where they show the experimental setup with the bear and the stuff. And really great stuff. Anyways, um, so we thought, well, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself here. So we thought, oh, OK, well, this would be good. Because we know that you know, one of the problems that polar bears are facing is that Arctic ice is, is decreasing, as you can see here. and um, you know, their food sources are more widely dispersed, and, and basically they're kind of starving to death. They're having a hard time finding enough food. Um, and we thought, well, okay, so we will let people uh, feel what it's like for a polar bear to move across the same stretch of land in the Arctic, 
you know, in, in 1970, in you know, 2010, and then in 2050. You know, so we're using satellite data for the first two experiences and then projected model data for the last experience. So they can feel that exponential growth and difficulty because the bear is going to be swimming a lot more. Well, so we wanted to tune it so it would be, you know, accurate. Um, turns out that um, bodies are funny. Um, we don't actually perceive the calories we burn in um, a linear way. So, you know, if, if these are the calories we're burning, uh, this is how, how much harder we think it is. So every extra calorie, it's like a lot harder, right? <laughs> and those of you who, you know, exercise on treadmills and things like that, this is probably very familiar to you. You know, you bump up that speed a little bit, and boy, does it seem like a lot more work. Um, so we thought, well, gosh, it's not just a matter of, of ratcheting up the difficulty to this 1 to 2.6 ratio. We really have to pay attention to how people are feeling it. But fortunately, uh, in kinesiology, they've been studying this for ages. There's a guy, his name is Borg, awesome, um, who in the 1960s uh, pioneered these instruments, uh, reported perception of effort, or RPEs. And they've been you know, varying these for years. But you know, the nice thing about them is they're validated. They've tested them with a whole host of different people, originally with uh, Army and, and other military folks. So you know, this started because they wanted to um, see how they could get the most out of their soldiers, I guess. Um, but, you know, they've used it for a lot of other reasons, too. And they've even developed scales that are kid-friendly. So this is a validated scale for kids. And so our first task was, was tuning this game. And so uh, we have these. Yeah, so, <laughs> so how, how they play the game is it's first person. So they're going through the Arctic. It's, you know, an immersive first-person player game. Uh, you'll notice they're wearing cute little slippers and cute little polar bear gloves. And I have a fun story about how I was able to purchase those, purchase those and questions that the receiving office had for me at UIC and what kinds of um, <laughs> subcultures I was into. Um, <laughs> but that's a story for another time. Um, so um, we were originally going to put sensors in, in the uh, slippers, but we found that for the pilot test, it was just a lot easier to uh, create pressure-sensitive platforms that they would stand on. And then inside the gloves, we had an accelerometer. And you know, this is an exercise weight, so we were varying the amount of weights that we were putting on the gloves. Now this will show, this is actually heart rate data from when we had people trying this. This is when they're walking and this is when they're swimming. And you can see, sure enough, you know, their heart rate goes up. And we would, you know, just see what their relative ratings were when they're walking versus swimming until they got the weights about right. And, you know, it's very imperfect, as you can imagine, uh, especially when you're dealing with kids this size and people that size. Um, they have different responses, uh, but, you know, we got close enough. Um, given the variation that we had. And so, you know, then the next step is um, showing this data to them. So uh, this is at the Brookfield Zoo. I don't know if you guys have been there to their polar bear viewing area. So, you know, you walk by and you can see polar bears swimming and we did the game right over in here. And um, in addition to them playing the game, you know, the real payoff comes with, with the graph that's getting built. So as this kid is moving, this is a graph of his calorie expenditure over time. And that's also shown, now we couldn't get a large display, unfortunately, for this first pilot test, but our next round of testing that we're going to start soon, we're going to have a very large display to support crowds so they can sit and watch as this kid's trying to hear he's swimming. For example, this girl's, well, she should be walking, but she's confused and she thinks she's swimming. Um, but um, the idea being that they, they can see the different calorie burn. And then after the experience, they see a plot of how many calories were burned total you know, for the decade that they were in. And sure enough, that over time, you start seeing an exponential growth start to occur. Uh, so, you know, we, we can use that as a jumping off point to talk about the uh, famous hockey stick graph, which is not actually a graph of the calories that polar bears burn, but a graph of temperature change. But they're equivalent in terms of the uh, rate of change and rate of impact of climate change. So that's, that's the work that we're doing there. Um, so the next step uh, when we go back into the zoo is to uh, assess people's understanding of these quantitative representations, these graphical representations of climate change, uh, to see if they, they um, come to a better understanding after experiencing this. Oh, interestingly enough, a side study we did in a classroom, a gym class actually, uh, we found that um, when kids would pantomime along with the person who was actually doing the activity, they showed very similar learning gains. So it may not be as important as we thought to have the weights there, which was kind of a bummer. I thought that was a neat spin on what we were trying to do. But it does let us scale it up or think about scaling it up to beyond the single person who's using it, which is kind of a problem for museum settings.